everyone. I'm Adrienne LaFrance, the Atlantic's executive editor. And today we're going to talk about a beloved iteration, the latest iteration of a beloved Atlantic tradition, the crossword puzzle. Now, crossword puzzles aren't exactly new to us. We launched our first one in 1977, some 120 years after founding the magazine. But our latest iteration is fairly new. Caleb Madison, my colleague and our puzzles editor, joined in 2018 to reinvent the crossword for the mobile web. Caleb's puzzles are enormously popular, and that's testament to his brilliance and creativity. He writes his own puzzles as well as commissions them. So I am very glad to welcome Caleb Madison, our puzzles editor, to talk a little bit about what it takes to make an Atlantic crossword. Hi, Caleb. Hey, Adrian. It's good to be here. Thanks for being here, and thank you so much to everyone who's joining us. We're so delighted to be with you and so grateful for your support for our journalism. So I want to have a quick conversation with Caleb, and then we'll open it up later to questions. We're also going to have a presentation from Caleb about what it takes to make a puzzle. But first, I thought you could start by telling us the story of how you came to love crossword puzzles. Yeah, crosswords are a, a bit of a specific passion to have, and I uh, got into it pretty young. Uh, my first memory was on family trips, my grandmother yelling clues out to the family and uh, us solving it, I guess, collectively, that social experience, which I think can really draws a lot of people to puzzles. Um, and I remember loving shout, shout, shouting them back whenever I could. And then I, I grew up in New York City, and they would give out this free newspaper. Uh, anyone in New York City would know AM New York or uh, the Metro right when you get into the subway. And I had a pretty long subway ride to school, and they had a crossword that I you know, started with and then eventually just got hooked on it as a way to pass the time on the commute to school. And to the point where then I saw this wordplay, doc, this documentary wordplay which is about the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament, which was in Brooklyn, and I didn't live far from that. And I went, uh, it was like, I was in ninth grade to the tournament and just checked. I didn't compete. I was too nervous. These were all celebrities to me at the time. And I uh, went up to Will Shorts afterwards, who's the editor of the New York Times Puzzle, and asked if he needed an intern that summer. And he, surprised, to my surprise, and everyone who I tell the story to was just like, yeah, come up, see, see if you like it. Well, I love that. It just so shows the t tenacity of just going after what you want. That's great. Yeah. Um, so I'll mention for those who are with us quickly that uh, to be thinking about what questions you'll have for Caleb and when you'd like to submit them at any time, you can do that via the chat box and we'll go to your questions um, in just a bit. But Caleb, let me turn it over to you. Tell us what is the magic behind the Atlanta crossword? How does it work? Well, yeah, I'm going to what I thought could be interesting, we have on, so I make the minis uh, throughout the week. We have a mini puzzle that gets bigger and harder throughout the week um, with a really easy, tiny puzzle on Monday and a pretty hard, bigger puzzle on uh, Friday. And then on Wednesday, uh, sorry, on Sunday for the weekend, we have a puzzle that I field uh, submissions from, uh, it could be anyone, it's totally freelance. And I love working with first-time constructors. I think it's uh, really important um, to get new blood in what can be kind of a become a roster. Uh, so I'm just going to give you guys a kind of walk you through the life of an Atlantic crossword puzzle, how I field those submissions, how they the format they come in, what I look for in a submission, how the submission turns into a puzzle, and then a, you know how it looks when it's published, which maybe you already know. Um, and I'm going to use as an example this past Sunday's puzzle, which is by Paolo Pasco, who's a constructor that I, when I used to work at BuzzFeed, he published his first puzzle at BuzzFeed when I was the editor there. He's an amazing constructor. Um, and I had a lot of fun with this puzzle, and it was a good theme, so I figured it would be a good starting point. So the the life of an Atlantic crossword. I'm better at making crosswords than I am at making uh, PowerPoint presentations. So... Uh, uh, <laughs> Bear, bear with me if the, the graphic design leaves something to be uh, desired. I, you know, I don't know what this font is. The Life in Atlantic Crossword. So it basically all starts with a theme. And these bigger crosswords, the New York Times has uh, one Monday through, uh, through Thursday, 
have three t- or more answers that are tied together in a way that provides kind of a structure of for the puzzle and gives you this like kind of meta fun element that you can follow when you're doing the puzzle. Um, and there are a bunch of different types of themes. There are infinite. They're, the more creative you can be, the better. I say they are tied together in a certain way. It leaves a lot of creative freedom. But I just wanted to give you guys some examples of types of themes that I've published in the Atlantic and that I kind of like. Um, so uh, sometimes themes will transform a bunch of phrases in the same way and then kind of reveal to you the logic of the transformation at the end. So this one is also by Paolo Pasco. I like his, this themes always make me laugh. And the theme is revealed by that last answer, changing the game. And if you look back at the answers that come before it, the last part of the answer are all like common games that have been like jumbled around to create a new fun phrase. So artichoke haters was clued something like, like people who hate a certain spiky uh, dish. But uh, if you rearrange haters, you get hearts, which is a game. Um, came to file um, was clued as the punny, like like uh, was prepared for a work uh, long day as an assistant uh, or paralegal, I think. And it, but it's it's came to life, but with life, the game at the end of it kind of mixed up. And you know, you guys can do the go through the rest. Uh, low Chris, it was clued via Chris Jenner, but that's risk. Um, the game risk uh, jumbled up. So that's one way to do. And then the revealer at the end was changing the game and how that was clued was like um, making a big splash in uh, an innovative splash or uh, how the other theme answers have been transformed. So that's it kind of reveals the method to the rest of the theme answers. Um, another thing that people do is, uh, a lot of people do is notice a similarity across a bunch of common, common phrases. So this one, the last phrase, Holy Trinity, tells you that the first word of all these common phrases, mackerel sky, which I didn't know, but I thought it was a cool enough thing to learn that I thought it could be a theme answer. It's like the cloud pattern where it's like really uh, like spack speckled in the sky. Um, it's in a lot of like like beautiful landscape portraiture. Macro Sky, Cow College, and Toledo, Ohio kind of form the Holy Trinity in that you can say holy before any of those first words. Holy mackerel, holy cow, holy Toledo. Um, another pretty common way of uh working a theme is you hide a word in phrases and then you can reveal that at the end this one the revealer was again at the end have a seat and all these phrases have seat like kind of sandwiched in the middle sea turtle tense atmosphere let's eat defense attorney um and the last one i put is rebuses we atlantic doesn't do a lot of rebuses yet but it's a very common theme it's when you kind of smush a bunch of answers into one square um the idea is that there's like a picture in that square that's what an actual rebus is like those picture book things like that say i i see you but it's an eye so the idea is that you draw an eye in a square and that represents i and they're like kind of embedded everywhere um so those are just but again these are just examples of themes there are uh i believe infinite types of themes that you can do um the more original often the more fun it is to solve you can see some of my graphic design uh, prowess on display here uh, in the what makes a good theme slide. Uh, to me, what makes a good theme is uh, four things, four and a half things, I'll call them, because this uh, was connected by an ellipse and kind of a staircase. Um, good theme phrases. To me, that means phrases, like long phrases that are sparkly is a word people use in the crossword biz a lot, fresh kind of in the language, exciting phrases, um, or just like fun to look at, fun to say. Um, and then the corollary is, or at least not bad, which is not forced. Sometimes when you're trying to make a theme work, you can want to pretend or force an answer to be that third answer to make your theme work. But it's not a thing that is common, or it's like an awkward way of phrasing something. And you, it's kind of obvious you're just doing it to make the theme work. I, those never make a fun solve for me. If if you 
completed the answer, if you put the answer in and you still have no idea what it is, I consider that a failure on my part as an editor. It means the content wasn't relevant to you, which is my job. Um, so the good theme phrases, dot, 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 or at least not bad. Uh, originality, uh, I love seeing types of themes I've never seen before, working within the constraints of the grid. Um, people have been doing this for the New York Times every day for a very long time. So to see something new is always a phenomenal thing. Um, specificity is kind of the other end of the spectrum of originality. That's why I, graphic, graphic design genius that I am, put it at the same line, but the other side. Um, Specificity is best exemplified by something called the Merle Regal rule. That's what people call it. Uh, Merle Regal was like a great puzzle maker um, uh, who passed away a couple years ago, but he is in the documentary Wordplay. He's, uh, he was on The Simpsons. He's a very funny, congenial guy. And he talks about this rule that uh, your theme criteria is too, if it's, if it can generate like, 10 answers, it's not specific enough. It should basically only be able to generate about the amount of answers that you fit in the puzzle. So if your theme was, I add, I, I switch two words in a two word phrase around, you can do that to any two word phrase. So it's, it's not specific enough to be a good crossword theme. Elegant is another word that people use. And the last thing I Got you. Got to talk about it if you're talking about crosswords. Is the aha moment, which is a term that Will Shorts coined in the '90s, to refer to that moment with a clue in an answer where you're like, "Oh my God, of course!" And with a theme when you're like, kind of solving it, you're like, "What? What? How do these all relate?" And at the end, it's like, "Oh my God, duh, of course." That's the fun moment of puzzles to me and to most people. And to do that, they have to be common phrases. You can't have you say of course to something you like have never heard of. Of course, the aha moment has to be a moment of recognition. It has to be a moment of like I've known this all along, but the way it was hidden, the way it was uh, obscured, was fun and uh, led me on a journey to get there. Um, so I'm going to take you through the journey of this one puzzle that I thought was so funny. Um, so the first, the way it starts is I get an email with a theme pitch. Um, this one, uh, this email is a little informal because Powell and I know each, have known each other for many years, but I just love this theme idea. It's so original to me. Um, so I, I'll just explain it. The, the theme is beatboxing, and what Paolo sent me was three answers that the first words of the answers are like, if you say them together, sonically, they're a beatbox. So it's like, it's Boots Riley and Make It Snappy, Cats in the Cradle. So you say boots and cats, boots and cats, boots and cats. I was like, that's so fun. That's such a new element to the solving experience that I've never seen in a puzzle before. So I was like, I think I have this on the next slide. I, I love it. I said, yes, I love this, Paolo. <laughs> but I had an idea. Um, I felt like, and I tried to explain this, and I think he, he got it because he got the theme, that it was missing a, a fourth answer that loops, that allows you to loop them. Because I feel like the more you are beatboxing in your head. The more times you can do it, the more fun this puzzle is going to be, the more that it'll stay with you. So I was like, you need a fourth one that's, um, here, what, what did I say on the email again? Um, like, uh, so, uh, yeah, so it's uh, uh, boots and cats, boots and cat, like a b or an and. So it's like, could be boots and cats and boots and cats. Um, that was a pretty hard thing to explain, but Paolo I've been working with for many years and totally got it, um, of course, and sent me back this grid. He put cats, he changed cats to cat's paw and changed, add, added sand, which is really nice because boots and cats and boots and cats and uh, that makes it so much more fun to me. Um, and again, just returning to my theme criteria, I love this because Boots Riley, super fresh, super like new, super exciting, and stay out is such a fun phrase to say. It's so sparkly. Um, and the rest of them are pretty common. Cat's paw I never heard of, but I looked it up and it seemed pretty common. Um, so this is the program that I use to make puzzles. I can't spend as much time as I want to on how to make a crossword puzzle. But basically, the first thing you do is you lay out the theme entries in the grid. Um, and one thing you may not have noticed about crosswords yet, but that's true about almost every crossword, is they have 180-degree rotational symmetry, means, which means that the black square scenario would remain exactly the same if you turned it 180 degrees upside down. That means 
the theme ent entries also have to have a certain symmetry. So in this, uh, I just took you through, I'm going to take you th really quickly through the steps of how this was probably made by pa Paolo. I, I wasn't there. He could have some witchcraft concocted for how he works that I don't know, but uh, this is how I would do it. Then you put in the rest of the black squares. Basically, you can put those anywhere. There are just two rules, no two-letter words. And the amount of word count, if you see under general on the right, hand column it's like in the top little box that says general 78 is the maximum number of words that a 15 by 15 crossword has these are rules that came were invented in the 1920s by the new york uh times editor margaret farrar um it just makes for a prettier grid a less cluttered grid and gives you a challenge in filling the grid which is what come next so every answer that's not a part of the theme in the grid is called the fill and how you fill is basically this program connects to a dictionary of a lot of phrases and words. And if you can see on the right, it's evaluating candidates based on the entry that I've selected on the left. So the blank, blank, T, blank, A, blank, blank, four down entry that connects Boots Riley and, and stay out. A list will come up to me on the right of all the possible words that could fit in there. And then after that, it's basically kind of a process of guess and check. Um, throughout as you move through the grid to create a vocabulary that's common and fun. Um, so I gave you an example of what that top left grid might look like. Um, and so Paolo sends me back to get back into the narrative of how the puzzle ends up published. Paolo gets me back a grid and I looked it over and I, there was a piece of fill that I didn't really understand. I uh, dot bomb. I was like, how would you clue that? And he was like, okay, yeah, he kind of caught to the fact that it was a little forced and did a revision on it because I, just, I don't feel like um, people should be expected to know that. Dot com bomb feels like more what it would be to me. And then it ends up here uh, this past Sunday. Oh, sorry for spoilers if people haven't done the puzzle yet, but sorry, too bad. Um, <laughs> as the puzzle at the uh, on the Atlantic website. So here it is with the five theme answers and i have highlighted the clue the revealer clue that tells you exactly um what's going on um yeah i think that such and th thus ends the life cycle of uh, atlantic puzzle this is great um you missed the part where i attempt to do it and can't figure out the words and then look up the clues <laughs> that's the next that's, thing that's the after the afterlife of the life cycle yeah right, that's, right. that's it coming to haunt you this is fascinating. I just learned so much, and I'm going to definitely remember the use of um, the word sparkly to describe words and phrases. That's great. Um, I'm going to ask a couple questions, and then I want to go. We have some great questions queued up from um, those of you with us. So one question I wanted to ask you is, you know, just listening to you talk about puzzles and just the way that you're thinking about words and how they relate to one another and clues, uh, it sort of makes me think of, you know, like you talk, people talk about athletes entering a state of flow or even like <laughs> mathematicians. Do you find that when you're working on puzzles, like you're, there's like a different part of your brain that's working than your normal self? Or is it just so much a part of how you think that it, it doesn't, you don't have to sort of like activate a different part of your brain? That's interesting. I, I definitely get into a different headspace that can make me lose track of time as everybody who, has tried to reach me knows. Um, but I also feel like it's not at this point, I've been doing it so long that it's relaxing and easy to get into that headspace. It is nice to be able to kind of, I mean, until it isn't until you're working on a part of a grid for a really long time and it's not coming together and you get a headache, but it, it can be a really nice escape, um, to only think about these symbols and how they interlock. And does it cha has it changed the way, like, I'm curious how it informs your relationship with the written word generally. Like, when you're reading a novel or a news article or something, do you find that you see things in words and how they relate to one another that, like, activates that part of your brain? Or, like, are you reading a, a story and you're noticing the word seat nestled in between multiple words? Or is it something you flip on and off? Uh, that is definitely, I love like verbal humor and puns. And I think that's, uh, that, that's the main love you have to have. If you're uh, working in crosswords, you have to have a love of the kind of malleability um, and bizarre connections that 
the randomness of the evolution of the English language has left us with. Um, but I, when I'm reading, I sometimes feel like I have to get out of scanning mode. You know how when you're reading, sometimes you're like when you're reading something, they have to read a little bit quickly and you're assessing for overall quality, like editor, editor stuff. You kind of just like take it all in. You don't really go along the line something sometimes. And when I'm reading a narrative, sometimes I have to be like, okay, just like look at the line of words, follow that. Um, but it definitely, it definitely, uh, I, I love words and I love noticing things about words and that definitely uh, follows me everywhere. I know that feeling too. I've definitely tried to, I've like been reading a book and then had the impulse to want to control F to find something which you can't do with a book. Totally. Um, I'm going to go to some questions from folks. We have um, from Caroline McGregor. Who is your favorite puzzle creator besides yourself, of course? Ooh. So, so many. Anybody who's on um, the uh, the American Values Club is an independent crossword uh, purveyor that I worked for for many years. Their editor, Ben Tossig, is a is a, a, one of the best in the game. And everybody's on that roster. It's like six constructors, and it's like the all-stars of Puzzledom. Um, I love uh, Paolo, the guy I just said, um, whose puzzle I just walked you through. This guy, Cameron Austin Collins, who writes puzzles uh, for The Times and New Yorker, and he is uh, very good. Yeah, there's so there's too many to even name. I love them all. But American Values Club, if you like my puzzles, s sign up. It's interesting, too, because it's uh, there's definitely this niche sort of puzzle community that we've talked about before. Um, I'm curious how you think about who your puzzles are for, because I know that you both understand the niche puzzle world, but you also think deeply about wanting your puzzles to be the ones that you make to be really inclusive. Yeah. I mean, I think at Buzzfeed, when I, my first editing job, I had this, I was young and I wanted everything. I wanted young, more young people to get into crosswords. Um, so I was insistent on using as much modern stuff as possible. Um, as I, as I've aged, as I have neared my thirties, I've, you're so uh, old now. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, w a withered old editor. Um, I've, I like being real. I think as, as diverse in every way that a puzzle can be is the best it can be because I I'm always thinking about this communal experience. That's how I think the dream of experiencing a puzzle is that you're with a bunch of people and each of their experiences of the world together can cobble together the answer to this puzzle that you've been given. Um, so to make that, a good experience to make that happen it i think is more it's more conducive if you include as much different types of information as possible with them all being relevant in that kind of world so in terms of who my puzzle is for it's like i i don't know i i i, I think it's like each answer almost should be for a different person but the puzzle itself could might be for everyone. That's a really corny, and I don't know if I know what it means. <laughs> um, no, it's great. And what about the big debate? I don't know if this is a big debate, but our our audience here seems to be debating a bit um, ink versus digital. So, like, what's your take on the experience of doing a crossword where you can actually, you know, write it into the onto paper versus on your phone or laptop? I th I think it's like uh, the the other great debate, uh, Shake Shack or In and Out, where it's like these are two different restaurants. Let get get both burgers if you can. I think minis are more conducive to the digital experience because it means they'll fit in a trip to the bathroom or a moment off from work or the end of your lunch break. But the experience of doing the puzzle on the train was analog for me and. I think it was important that it was analog. You don't get service down there, um, probably still. Um, and there's something so fun about drawing on, like, like it, it's more interactive, I think. It's more uh, tactilely interactive with the puzzle maker. We have a question from Sally Schaefer who asks, why is the symmetry necessary, the sort of 180 degree thing you mentioned? I think the answer is that it's not necessary. It is just become standard. I've published a bunch of puzzles that uh, don't have that symmetry because of the theme entries, and I felt like it was worth it. And I also don't think 
uh, it experiences, it, it, it affects the experience of solving to a crazy degree. And uh, everything a puzzle maker does should be about the experience of solving. However, I concede it, I see what where Margaret Farrar was coming from because it does give the crosswords these really distinctive patterns that I think have uh, made them visually pleasing as much as intellectually pleasing. This is a somewhat similar, at least related question from Janice Weaver. And she's asking, how important is it to be consistent? The example she's thinking about is um, that first example that you gave where there were names of games scrambled in the clues and you had yes. uh, Chris to risk, but then you also had um, a two word one for big red for bridge. Yes, um, and yes. I guess maybe this goes to the question of how forced something can seem, but I'm curious what you think in terms of the sort of the symmetry or consistency required there. It's always a conversation between me and the puzzle maker. Um, uh, often it's a subjective judgment on my part about how good the theme is, how many other options there are, and how much the answer deviates from the rest of the theme. Um, for that one, I think it did cause some confusion in a way that compromised some of the fun of the puzzle, but I liked the symmetry enough, and I al almost thought that it could be, and this could be just me justifying a mistake or a oversight, but I almost thought the two-word last answer could be a bit of a challenge if you were going through the, a, a fun challenge, if you're going through the entries from top to bottom. And you came across the last one, and then you had this problem. Um, maybe it's a, a, an extra aha moment. We have a question next from Andrew Long, who asks, how long does it take to construct a crossword? It's a good question. It's a, one I get a lot, and it really depends on the puzzle. It's uh, Mondays, the smaller it is, the generally the easier it goes down. Um, but sometimes I'll be working, a, I'll have decided a word should be one across on a Monday puzzle and be really working hard to make all the rest of the words very common words. Um, but I would say anywhere from uh, the, the construction of the grid, anywhere from two to four to six, uh, Very, it's very variable within two to six hours, I would say. Um, and then the cluing process, which you go over, is probably it again depends on how big the puzzle is a uh, somewhat similar hour like a little less hour to three hour commitment depending on how uh good you want to make the clues great and now from and thanks for all these questions these are great um just a reminder for anyone who joined late that if you have questions you want to put in the chat um we'll get to them that way this one comes from beth stevens who asks about how we guard against errors, so how the puzzle is tested. And I know you showed the program that has the list of words, but we also, of course, have our, our copy desk. So maybe you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, the list of words is so big that if I wasn't quality controlling every word, it would you would get a bunch of like genuses of oxen and ancient medieval weapons, things we don't really, I don't like to expect people to know. But after I write the clues, we have a copy. I work with two copy editors who are amazing and uh, have the eyes of hawks. And we talk about really specific grammar stuff sometimes, fact stuff sometimes, and difficulty level a lot of the times. But they're, they're my main resource for making sure these puzzles are uh, spick and span. Yes, our hawk-eyed copy desk, they're amazing. Um, from Eric Kong, we have, uh, what is your take on using the grid checker on puzzles? He says, some of my friends think it's egregious cheating, but I'm definitely okay with using it. And then a little emoticon with the tongue sticking out. <laughs> I definitely think you should feel free to use it. It's a, it's a, you're only competing against yourself. So if <laughs> it's helping you get better and helping you stay with the puzzle and helping you continue, it's also going to teach you something because you might not have known the answer to that puzzle or that answer. It might be a puzzle that you couldn't finish. Um, so I am very uh, uh, descriptivist when it comes to puzzle solving. Get it done however makes you happy. That's what I say. 
Um, and we're going to wrap up soon here. One other question I wanted to ask is thinking about, uh, because you've spent time looking at puzzles over the history of puzzle making, how much has the form changed over the many decades that crossword puzzles have been popular? Yeah, it's, it's super interesting. Crosswords have actually been a cockroach in a really changing media environment. There haven't been many publications who have given up on the crossword. I think that's because it's it's beautiful. I mean, it's a it's a ritualized way of organizing the information you see in the rest of the puzzle in a fun way, in a way where you can actually kind of disengage with the meaning of sentences and see the beauty of language for its own sake. Um, so I, I I think that uh, it, it's it's definitely changed in form and uh, become more accessible in beautiful ways. Um, but the essence of it, I think, remains. Um, and I think, yeah, I hope, I hope will. You know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a lovely place for us to close. I want to say thank you, Caleb, again, so much for being here and sharing this with all of us. And thank you to all of you for joining us and for your very generous support of The Atlantic. And please tune in to the second night of the Ideas Stage tonight. We'll get underway at 7 o'clock tonight. Eastern. Um, we'll hear from the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. We'll hear from Dr. Anthony Fauci, actors Billy Porter and Chris Evans, and much more. We have plenty more of the Atlantic Festival after that for the next two days. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian.